he constrained his disciples to get into the ship. If he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, then you know already that this has got to be purposeful. He constrained them to get into the ship, and this ain't on the paper, but I want to talk about it from the Holy Ghost right quick. Sometimes God will constrain you to get in something that's getting ready to give you trouble. I'm not talking to everybody. I'm just talking to a few of y'all that know. Sometimes God will put you in a mess on purpose because he wants to see if you're going to trust him like you did when you thought that he was in the same boat you were in. The Bible says, wait a minute now, he constrains them, his disciples to get into the ship and to go where? Before him. Unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Let me help y'all right quick with another thing. Sometimes God will constrain you by yourself so that your enemies can't laugh at you in case you fail to tell y'all quiet now. He sends the multitude away. Go to the next verse right quick. The Bible says, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, wait a minute. I want y'all to see that the next thing he do after he send the crowd or the spectators away, the Bible says that he leave them alone by themselves because this is getting ready to be a test where he first tried to show them that whether he's present or not, he's still God. Go to the next verse right quick. Next verse says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea. Everybody say right there in the middle of it. The Bible says tossed with waves for the wind was contrary. Uh-huh. And the next verse says, and in the fourth watch of the night, in the fourth watch of the night, is when Jesus went into them, but he was walking on water. Wait a minute, don't pass yet. Let me make sure I say this for everybody who call yourself prayer warriors. The fourth night is right around, if I'm not mistaken, the four o'clock in the morning period. And around that six o'clock or seven o'clock time. See, if you really want to see God move, sometimes you got to wake up in the wee hours of the night. Yes. He's walking in the fourth night. Y'all stay with me here in the fourth, in, in, in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went unto them. The Bible says he's walking on water. Go to the next verse. I'm coming, y'all. I'm going to sit down a minute. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Huh, God. You got to be careful what you call the devil and what you call go. Because some of us have lost our discernment to the point that we're calling the devil God and calling the God devil. All right, I'm going to leave y'all alone. Go to the next verse right quick. And the Bible says, but straightway Jesus spoke unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. He says, be not afraid. Wait a minute. This ain't on the notes. I got to tell you because the Holy Ghost told me to tell you. When Jesus is on the scene, you ain't supposed to be afraid of nothing. When God is on the scene, you ain't supposed to be scared of nothing. Baby, I don't care how long you've been the, 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 the line on the Wizard of Oz. It's time for you to turn to the one who got the most courage. All right. Yeah, but let me, let me, let me, let me keep, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. He said, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him. And say, Lord, if it be thou, if it be you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Now, wait a minute now. We got a problem here because if that was me, people would say, you're tempting God. But you're not tempting God when God is in something already that you're trying to get in. See, by now they'll tell me, you, 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 that's temptation. You tempt the, the, the Lord said, don't tempt the Lord that God. But right now, he's in the water. So why I can't get in the water with the God who's in? Oh, okay, y'all quiet now. Go to the next verse. And the Bible says, and I'm almost done. The Bible says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. We're going to stop right there because there's going to be a series. I want to talk from the subject, water walkers. Water 
walkers. By the time I finish today, some of you are going to be in your first class or your first semester of knowing whether you are a water walker or not. Before we get into it, let me just kill all the discrepancy of those that tried to talk about this particular story because they always say, um, man can't walk on water right now, this, that, and the other. Truth of the matter is, you can, and I got a reason why you can. But when we look at this particular scripture, when we talk about the water, you'll see that water is considered to be uh, symbolic to the troubles in our life right now. And when you see this particular text, I want y'all to see this and walk with me real good. In this text, church, we see three main characters. One of the characters being water, one of the characters being Peter, the other character being Jesus. Y'all stay with me right quick. This is going to be the boring part. I need you to walk with me right quick. But when you look at water, I'm not trying to be deep, but when you look at water, water has many identities. Yeah. I know you think that water is water, but water has many identities. For one, there is a water called living water. When you find, when you find living water, you'll find it in John chapter 7 verse 38. Where it says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. In the Greek, watch this, living is the word zoa. Y'all got that zoa. Meaning to live on life. Everybody say zoa is living. And living means live or life. When you see the word zoa in the Greek, it means live or life. It is symbolic to the water in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 21. That brought forth life to every living creature that was produced out of the waters. It's the same water that Jesus tells the woman in John chapter 4 and verse 14. That those that drink this water shall never thirst again because it is considered living water. Everybody say living water. Not only do you find that water is identified as living water, Tasha. But if you look in your Bibles, you'll find out that water is identified as raging water. Everybody say raging water. Raging water, when you look at it, you will find it in Luke chapter 8 and verse 24. Where Jesus was sleeping on the bottom of the boat and, and, and when the water began to rage, the disciples panicked and awoke Jesus and asked, did he care that they were about to perish? Then he arose, the Bible says, and rebuked the winds and the raging of the water. And they ceased and there was a calm. When you look at that word raging in the Greek, the word rage in the Greek is the word kludon. Everybody say kludon. Which means waves that are full of violent uh, uh, agitation. It's symbolic to the same raging of water talked about uh, in Psalms 89 and 9. If you have to reset it, reset it. Uh, thou rulest the raging of the sea, the Bible says. When the waves there uh, arise, uh, thou stillest them. Uh, somebody say raging water, raging water. So you see that water is identified with living water and then there is raging water. But not only will you find uh, raging water and, uh, bit, uh, uh, and find uh, uh, a thing called uh, living water, but there's a thing called uh, bitter water. Everybody say bitter water. Uh, bitter water, I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about the projection screen, not the projection screen. Uh, if you have to... Uh, reset it to put the scriptures up do that uh when you look at the word bitter water bitter water you will find it in a place called mora everybody say mora uh it is m-a-r-a-h uh, you'll find it in exodus chapter 15 and verse 23 where the Bible says, and when they came to Mara, uh, they, 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 they could not drink of the waters of Mara, watch this, for they were bitter. Everybody say bitter. 
Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Uh, the reason why the name of it was called Mara Church is because the word Mara in the Hebrew uh, is the word bitter. Uh, in mean, it means that it has a sharp taste or a pungent taste or it has a smell that nobody wants to smell. It, it's by no means sweet and it is no, it's by no means drinkable. Everybody say bitter water. But not only will you find living water, bitter water, and raging water, but when you look at the, water, the identity of waters, you'll find out there's a thing called sweet water. Somebody say sweet water. It is the water you find in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 25. The Bible says where after much complaining or after they complained much about the fact that they had, that the children of Israel had been traveling so long, they begin to murmur towards uh, Moses. And the Bible says God shows Moses a stick or a branch and tells him to cast it into the water that was already bitter. The Bible says when he cast it, watch this, the stick into the water of bitter. The Bible says that the water then became sweet water. Everybody says sweet water. When you look at the word uh, sweet, in the Greek, the word sweet is a word called, watch this, uh, in the Greek, it, it is the word, watch this, that is, it, when we look at the word sweet water, I'm sorry, you'll find it, watch this, mentioned in James chapter 3 and verse 11. When the Bible, when the question is asked, can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same fountain? So somebody say sweet water. So you will find that the identities of water is, and I'm coming, is uh, living water. You'll find bitter water. You'll find raging water. And you'll find the identity of water as uh, uh, sweet water. But not only will you find the identity of, the identity of water as trouble, as, as, as sweet water, but not only that, you'll find that water is identified with a thing called trouble water. I'm coming, church, I promise. The enemy trying to work against me, but I'm about to kill that devil. Uh, listen, trouble water is the water you find in John chapter 5 and verse 4. Where you will find that an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in the water was made whole. And whosoever disease he had, the word, uh, uh, it means that they were literally made whole. Now, when you look at the word uh, trouble in the Greek, it is the word to wrestle. Everybody say to wrestle. It means to stir into agitation, watch this, for a metaphorical change. So everybody say metaphorical change. That means that you go in one way, but you come back out another. All right, all right. So when you look at these particular uh, 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 identities of the water, you'll find out that it's mind-blowing that water has all of these different identities. Uh, and, and, and they work in different ways, and it works in different capacities. Uh, but water rather is raging, rather is trouble water, rather is sweet water, or rather is bitter water. It has no variance or is not even consistent. Consider all water proceeds or is supplied. Everybody say water, water. That's the character of water. But when we look at the other character, the character is named Jesus. I'm coming, church, I promise. Uh, Jesus, when you look at Jesus, it ain't really nothing we can say about him except uh, these words. And that is that he is the Christ. Uh, he is the Lord. Uh, he is the Logos. Uh, he's the master. He's the word. Uh, he's the son of God. Uh, he's the son of man. Uh, he's the son of David. And he's the lamb of God. Uh, if we had to talk about Jesus, I'm just saying. Uh, yo, just in case you said that's not enough. Uh, he's, the, he's the second Adam. He's the new Adam. And he's the last Adam. He's the light of the world. He's the king of Jews. He's the rabbi and the rabbi. He's Emmanuel. He's the bread of life. He's the perfecter of our faith. And he's the bridegroom. When we talk about Jesus, who's the character in this book? Oh, you said that wasn't enough. Okay. Then he's the chief cornerstone. He's the deliverer. He's faithful and true. He's way, truth, and life. He's the high priest. He's the head of the church. He's the king of kings. He's the light of the world. The light of Judah, the medi mediator, he's the, the Messiah, the prophet, the redeemer, he's the rock, the son of the most high, and he is uh, the savior. 